Hello everyone, this is chapter 4 of the Eggplant Performance Tutorial Series and in this uh, particular chapter we're going to be talking about script generation. So in the last chapter we got as far as uh, creating a recording of our interactions with uh, the NopCommerce website and it's from this recording that we're now going to be able to generate a script. And so I don't need to write the script from, from scratch, I'm going to use the information we collected in the recording uh, to generate something that uh, I may or may not be able to run straight away. So the chances are that I'll probably need to do some things to this recording in order to get it ready uh, for use in the performance test. Uh, the most basic example of something I know I already need to do is uh, change the username uh, that I logged in as so that I can log in with different users and where that those credentials are taken from a data file uh, instead of something being hard-coded in the script. Um, there might be other things that I need to do to it. Uh, that's something that you discover uh, as you're going through the motions of, of getting a script up and running. Uh, but for now, the, the next step is to uh, start the script generation wizard. And so uh, when you select your recording, uh, you should uh, see a button for generating scripts. Uh, you'll also see that option when you right-click the recording. Uh, there it is over here. Now, the first thing you'll want to do is uh, select which programming language you want your scripts to uh, result in. So, uh, the options for the web virtual user are C Sharp or Java. Uh, I have a personal preference towards C Sharp, so that's what I'll be uh, showing uh, initially. But as far as this dialogue is concerned and the, the script generation process, uh, the actual resulting language doesn't really matter. The options are going to be the same uh, throughout this wizard. It's only the actual end product that'll be different depending on which option you select here. Uh, even then, uh, there's very little difference between the two uh, languages as far as what you can do with the API is concerned. Uh, you'll just have a slightly different syntax depending on which, uh, which one you go for. Uh, so for now, I'm just sticking to C-sharp. That enables the next button here, so I progress to the next step. So this is where we uh, determine which virtual user we want to be using. And so uh, because I'm dealing with web and I've selected C Sharp as my uh, language of choice, uh, these are the two options I'm given. Uh, if you chose the Java version, you wouldn't actually see this ASP.NET virtual user. Uh, this is actually one that's specific to C Sharp uh, because ASP.NET is a Microsoft technology. It links um, uh, somewhat to the .NET framework, and so uh, we've implemented a virtual user that is uh, based on C-sharp and is able to deal with ASP.NET based website specific things easier. And uh, if you've ever tested an ASP.NET based website, you've probably heard of something called view state and event validation. Uh, these are hidden form fields that are just automatically handled uh, by the ASP.NET VU, so you don't have to uh, implement logic for that yourself. Um, but for now, uh, I'm going to be using the web C-sharp virtual user, uh, but you may have noticed that the next button is actually grayed out. And that's because uh, it's mandatory to create uh, what's known as a custom virtual user. So, uh, a custom virtual user uh, allows you to do quite a few different things, actually. Uh, first and foremost, it is a place where you can store common functions or methods uh, that multiple different scripts might want access to. So the need for this is as a result of not being able to call methods from other scripts directly, uh, which would be bad practice anyway, as you wouldn't want a script to become a dependency uh, on other scripts. Instead, it makes much more sense for that kind of code to exist in a place of its own, uh, which in this case manifests as the custom VU. So the example here is creating a random uh, username uh, in this particular method, and as a result of this method existing in the custom VU, uh, it's automatically available to my script as well. And uh, behind the scenes, what's actually going on is called inheritance uh, in object-oriented programming. So every single script you create normally just inherits the capabilities of whichever VU you select. Uh, for example, the web VU. But as soon as you create a custom VU, scripts will instead inherit from the custom VU. And the custom VU, in turn, will then inherit from the base VU. The custom VU also allows you to reference third-party libraries, essentially making code in these libraries available for you to use in your scripts. So third-party libraries typically manifest as DLLs uh, for C-sharp-based scripts and JAR files for Java-based scripts. 
finally, the custom VU also adds hooks uh, into various events that allow you to override the default behavior of these uh, events. Uh, for example, there's hooks into the process of raising errors or warnings or uh, dealing with uh, requests and responses before uh, they're actually processed. So you can basically intercept these calls and change what should happen depending on various factors. For example, uh, the normal course of action when you receive a 404 response, a not found page, uh, is for there to be a warning uh, placed into the virtual user's event log. You may decide that you don't actually want to raise that warning, uh, you want to just ignore it effectively, and so you would be able to use the onWarn uh, hook in order to uh, ignore 404s. Uh, so custom virtual user uh, is typically going to be application specific in some way, uh, so you're going to have a, a virtual user um, that uh, represents the application and therefore multiple scripts that you generate from that custom VU, uh, you'll easily be able to see that, oh, this, this script belongs to the NopCommerce application, for example. So uh, this is what I'm going to call my custom virtual user because I'm testing the NopCommerce website, and so it makes sense to, to name it like that. You can set up multiple levels of hierarchy, so you might have a company-wide virtual user that you want to create, underneath which you then would have your application-specific views. Uh, it's up to you how you design uh, your setup here. Okay, so with the custom view out of the way, uh, we can now actually work with this recording. And so uh, by default, when, you, when you're in this dialogue here, uh, we're saying that uh, everything in this recording uh, should end up in the script. And you know, what will end up in the script is these four transactions, the ones that we executed as part of the recording. But in actual fact, we're dealing with um, a few different scripts here, actually. Arguably, uh, you could even make three scripts out of just this one uh, recording. So you could say, well, browse to home page is sort of a script in its own right. It's a pretty crucial one, usually. Uh, you, you want your home page to perform quite well, but you might also want to be able to suddenly browse to the home page uh, while doing some other kind of workflow. So having it on its own as just that one transaction in a separate script allows you to, uh, it's basically modularizing your code, and so it gives you great flex flexibility when it comes to designing uh, different workflows. So I'm just going to call this one uh, script uh, browse to home page. That's literally all it's doing. And then I can click the Add Script button here uh, to define what the next uh, part of this recording should result in, what script this should result in. Uh, in this case, we've actually got two transactions. Uh, we've got both browsing to the login page and then also submitting the login. So that is the full extent of the login operation in this case. And so it makes sense to have a login script that just uh, contains those two transactions. Finally, the last one left is Logout. Uh, so you probably want to separate out uh, the logout as well so that it's you're not suddenly logging out a user before you've actually finished your workflow. So, so there we go. From a single recording, we can generate these three scripts. Next up is generation rules. So this is a pretty big topic that we'll uh, come back to in subsequent chapters, no doubt, uh, because this is, this is where a lot of the uh, heavy lifting happens when it comes to uh, getting your script set up for uh, multiple users and uh, you know, repeated execution. So, and, and also performing verification checks to make sure that when a server sends you a response that it is one that you're actually expecting to see, and if not, that uh, you'll be told about it when, when things are going um, in an unexpected way. Uh, so with generation rules, I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, creating new rules for now. I'm just going to talk a bit about these built-in rules that we have. So uh, we're already aware of some uh, rules that make sense to apply to uh, the vast majority of scripts. Uh, the top two are the ones that spring to mind and, uh, as the most uh, useful of these default rules. So the first one is verifying that the page title matches what was originally in the recording. So this is actually quite useful. So when you browse to a page, uh, that page will have some kind of a title. 
um, and you can use that to ascertain whether or not the virtual user is actually looking at uh, the page that they're expecting to be on. Uh, for example, once you log in, you might suddenly have a title that mentions that you're logged in as a particular user, and so it's probably worth setting up a verification check uh, there to ensure that uh, the login has actually been successful. So you're using the title as a way of inferring that uh, the transaction was successful. So if, if the page title is suddenly different, then you would actually see a warning um, uh, in the virtual user's event log to say, hang on a second, we're expecting to see this page title, but it's something completely different. Chances are the VU has veered off of its course uh, and, and might need uh, investigation as a result. Uh, it's very similar with the verification check below that, which is actually checking the HTTP uh, response code or the result. Uh, so uh, when when you send a request, uh, most of the time you're expecting a 200 OK response back, uh, but that's not always going to be the case. When you put a server under load, uh, all kinds of weird and wonderful, and wonderful things might happen, and one of them could be that the server instead sends an HTTP 500 to indicate that it's uh, encounter some kind of a server error um, and again you would want to know as soon as that happens and so this default rule will be applied to all uh, requests in your script and they'll let you know as soon as we're receiving some unexpected status code when compared to the original recording. The promote rules uh, are making certain uh, requests appear as their own top-level requests um, that's something that'll probably make more sense when we actually start looking at uh, the script, so I'm just going to ignore these for now. But again, uh, in almost all cases, you want to leave these uh, active uh, uh, when you generate your scripts, and which is why they're built in default rules. The last one here um, is basically taking care of Unix timestamps that appear in your script. So uh, Unix timestamps uh, time are measured since the beginning of the epoch in 1970, 1st of January, I believe. Uh, and so you know, when we encounter those, usually they're meant to represent the current time. And so we actually find and replace any uh, timestamps that look like they're meant to represent the current uh, time so that at runtime we will actually send the current time, not what was originally recorded into the script. Okay, hitting next for now brings up the advanced options here. So there are quite a few uh, different options available uh, when it comes to um, you know, modifying how the script is generated. One of the things we added in uh, version 7.1 uh, was the ability to ignore page resources. So this is actually off by default, uh, because with it on, you would actually not end up downloading things like JavaScript, CSS, and images uh, from the server. So there is actually less network traffic and you know, slightly less load on the server. Not significantly, though. Uh, but it does vastly um, uh, reduce or potentially reduce the size of your scripts or uh, the uh, you know uh, the apparent complexity of scripts because there won't be any code for downloading uh, these additional resources so you may or may not want to make use of something like that uh, there's also this uh, script mode itself so it does one generate the script in page mode or URL uh, if you choose URL then every single request uh, that was made as part of the recording will have corresponding code in uh, your script in page mode we're automatically handling certain things such as uh, redirects so you won't actually ever see redirects uh, written out in, in the actual automation code so in most cases you want to use uh, the page mode it results in shorter scripts uh, that are easier to work with uh, web forms, uh, this is uh, something that's, uh, I believe, unique to eggplant performance in, in how we handle um, web forms. Uh, so, um, so basically, when you're dealing with forms, uh, there are often hidden form fields or fields that don't actually change between uh, being received from the server and subsequently being sent back from the clients. So Eggplant Performance is able to detect these in such a way that you won't even see any code for these fields in your generated scripts. And so the end result is that you only ever need to worry about fields that actually changed um, between being received and being sent. So for example, uh, the login form on the NobCommerce web page, uh, the only fields that change were the username and password, uh, but there might have been other form fields that we're not even aware of. We don't have to worry about those because of this automatic form handling. 
Uh, so the, the tricky part is actually linking up the forms received from the server with forms subsequently sent from the client. And so eggplant performance uses a variety of different te techniques to do this, uh, and that's uh, as a result of which uh, we have these different scoring uh, mechanisms. So uh, you can change these if you if you need to, but they're pretty sensible defaults. In most cases, you can leave these as is and have the form matching uh, work as expected. Cookies, uh, similarly to web forms, they are to a large extent uh, automatically handled. Uh, so you know, if a server uh, sets a cookie, then we automatically know to keep track of that cookie and uh, send it with any subsequent requests to that host. So they, again, don't need to worry too much about this, uh, but there are some options there to default uh, to modify the default behavior should you uh, need to do so. General options, um, you know, we're by default putting in quite a lot of comments into the script that make it a bit easier to work with that with that script. And by default, we don't generate uh, we don't generate code for HTTP 404. So if you encountered any 404s as part of your recording, uh, the default behavior is for those not to actually result uh, end up in the automation code, um, and that's usually because you know 404s. Uh, you, you probably know that they're happening, and you probably don't want to simulate uh, someone you know browsing and, and receiving a 404 response. That may or may not always be the case, and so we have the option here to generate code for them if you so uh, wanted to do so. Uh, likewise, for generating code for requests that actually didn't receive a response during the recording, uh, you can still generate code for those, but m most times you will probably not want to do that. Uh, and so this is a way of encouraging you to investigate why those requests didn't result in a response. Authentication that deals with um, HTTP authentication uh, or even proxy authentication, depending on uh, you know what is being used. So if you're having to type in a username and password uh, when you browse to a site, then you should pre-populate that information here. You can put it into the script itself uh, once it's been generated, but you know this it gives you a GUI to do uh, that sort of thing, uh, and so it's uh, and it also then persists uh, for this uh, script as well. Uh, proxy settings, if you do uh, need to go to a proxy server in order to get out to the, the actual server you're trying to test, then you can specify uh, the uh, server uh, host and uh, port uh, values here. And finally, regions. Uh, there are special areas within your script where you can put code uh, that will persist between generations. So uh, the, a generation of a script actually happens throughout uh, the creation of a script if you're using generation rules. So generation rules are modifying how that generation takes place and so in order to apply new generation rules to a script you regenerate uh, the script and, and it's as part of that regeneration that you may lose manual script edits that you've made to the script um, and so if you want to persist any of, of that script code, you should place that code but, uh, inside of regions that are automatically generated in the script. So uh, this option here is really just to um, not include any regions should you ever want to do so. Okay, we're done, so I just have to hit the generate button uh, and eventually the generator will kick in and uh, generate some scripts for us. There we go. Okay, all done, so I can just hit finish, and there we go. We have our three scripts that were generating, generated from the one recording, and we can now uh, proceed to the next step, which will uh, likely be to work with these scripts, put them into some kind of a workflow, and then create a test so that we can actually uh, run them and, and see what happens. So uh, the next chapter is going to be talking about uh, generation rules, as well as having a look uh, at the contents of the scripts themselves. So stay tuned for that, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.